to Eggs the Podcast, featuring the best and brightest minds in business leadership, entrepreneurship, and technology. Today, we have a very special guest, former CEO, world traveler, and seasoned entrepreneur, Brent Perkins. Brent has an incredible story to share, from his successful career as a CEO to his personal transformation after a life-altering event. That story is laid out for us in his new book, Paper Cuts, The Art of Self-Delusion, and here on the show, we'll explore some of the powerful concepts he uncovers within its pages. On the show, we're going to discuss the power of choice and how it can be a cure for anxiety and depression. Brent will also share his insights on living a fulfilling life, finding balance between family and business, and embracing a life of integrity. Get ready for an inspiring conversation as we uncover the wisdom and experiences that have shaped Brent's remarkable journey. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Brent Perkins. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Brent, welcome for uh, welcome to Eggs. We're glad to have you, man. Yeah, super excited to be here. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So Brent, let's talk a little bit about just sort of who you are and what you do. You've got this really interesting story and took a dramatic pivot. And for people who are like guests of, you know, or, or listeners to this show, one thing I dig into ad nauseum is these career pivots and these big changes in life, because not only have I been trying to go through some of these myself, but also just I, I find it fascinating when people are brave enough to take the turn, right? So I'd love to, you know, just sort of talk a little bit about your past, but also get into sort of the present. Sure. Um, I mean, I'm 45 years old. I got uh, a 19 year old and a 16 year old. I spent my my life chasing a corporate type career. Although I started some businesses along the way, I've sat in a CEO chair for over a decade. Um, yeah, and then I hit a point where, after almost 20 years of marriage, I uh, went through a divorce, uh, stepped out of my career, got this crazy, weird, possibly divine calling to write a book, and. Uh, <laughs> We pivoted and we're off in another direction. So that's high level. <laughs> well, and it's a lot to to consider too, because as I as I understand it, basically this whole journey sort of began in 2022. So like this is you know recent development, and it's a dramatic shift from what you were doing. Yeah. So maybe let's talk a little bit about that. You know how you sort of came to realize that it was time to make the pivot. I mean, obviously you described you know you've had a couple you know big you know milestones <laughs> in your life that that might force a pivot. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Just so everybody's clear the <clears throat> the journey probably started eight to 10 years ago. It took that long to integrate, learn about myself, just, you know, pull through to the point where the actual pivot, like I pulled the trigger uh, nine months, 10 months ago, right. In December of 2022. So I was actually speaking to a friend of mine who's an ER doc this morning, because uh, he's wanting to make some life changes. And I, I, I think I distilled it down to where what really was the impetus for this is I read a book by Martha Beck called The Way of Integrity. And in there, she challenges her readers, hey, for 30 days, don't tell any lies. And I don't mean like big, hairy, ugly lies. I mean the whitewashed, like, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm great. Yeah, that's BS. <laughs> down to that level of do not tell a lie. And this includes how you talk to yourself in your head. And I did that in exactly a year ago. And I showed up to work different and I showed up to my family different and I showed up to life different. And it's part of why I stepped out of my career. It's part of why when I sat there looking for the next gig after five years of being CEO of this uh, LED manufacturing company, everything in me said, don't do the next thing. That's not what's next. That's not what's what's an in integrity for you. And I could not listen because I made this promise to stay in integrity and not even tell myself lies. And that is what drove me to step into, explore, surrender to crazy things that are now the new direction of my life. Well, it's super interesting, like the, the power of intention. Right. Mm -hmm. Like when you actually set your mind to doing something like this. So in this case, it was integrity. Right. You weren't going to lie. You know, and I have an experience kind of like that years ago when uh, we first moved to Utah. It's been 10 or 11 years ago now um, when I I took a, a job in an ad agency down here and it was my first job in an ad agency. I had come from Idaho originally and there was no ad ag agency where I grew up. So I ran my own company. I called myself an agency, but I'd never been in one. And uh, so I, I was able to land a job down here in Utah and, and go to work for this agency. But one of the things I did from day one was, you know, because I've always been kind of a, 
uh, I don't know, like a quiet guy or keep to myself, not be a real wave maker, you know, that kind of thing. And but one of the things I said when I took that job was that I have to make a change here, that if I want to move through the ranks, I've got to be intentional, intentional about making decisions or having opinions or just, you know, actually, you know, saying what I'm thinking when I'm thinking it. This is what they're hiring me for. Right. Yep. And uh, but in making that decision, I went on. I was, you know, their most quickly promoted art guy for a few years. Uh, I was laid off, unfortunately, after three years, but went on to be their highest paid freelancer and one year even their highest paid employee of the whole company, uh, you know, as a as an outside resource, <laughs> you know, because of yeah. the relationships we'd built and all that stuff, you know. So, like, I did so much good for reputation just by being intentional. And so it's really interesting that even though you wouldn't necessarily think that something like just being honest with yourself would be all that powerful, setting your mind to it and doing it, I think, is critical not only for just – you know, making even a little change like that, just trying to be more honest, but for the, you know, next to come bigger pivot. You were talking. Yeah. I actually take this concept or took this concept in my own life and I pulled it apart a little bit more and uh, I ended up writing about it in the book, but I call for me, what you're speaking to your experience is more than just being intentional. It's about the intent to be intentional and when you put intent on the front end of intentionality, it's like supercharging what you want out of life, right? Because you showed up to work in a way that was very intentional to be amazing at what you did. You were the highest paid person. You were promoted because of the work you were doing. You were intentional at your job, but you put intent on the front end. You did certain things to show up in a way that allowed you to be this creative genius, to be amazing at what you did. Um, Another quick example on this is, you know, if you're going to go out on and have a date night with your partner, right? The fact that you set a date night and you're going on a date, that's intentionality, right? But the intent on the front end is, hey, I got out of work two hours early. I took a shower. I cleared my head. I turned my phone on silent. I got myself in a place where I could show up and hear you, see you and be there for you because nothing else mattered. So when I stepped into that intentionality, that intentional event, I was there. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's right. And, and I actually like that idea. I mean, it sounds a little funny intent on the intentionality, right? But but I think you're right, right? It is that pregame. It's that sort of mental yep. awareness that I'm going to do this thing. And then the intention piece becomes sort of the execution of that, right? Exactly. So I've decided I've going, I'm going to do this and this is my execution. And actually, and we, we can get into this a little bit later after we get sort of through your story. But I mean, this is sort of one of the places I found myself as a self-employed guy. And, you know, I no longer, I mean, I'm still freelancing for former agency, but I, I do a bunch of other stuff now too. And, um, but I find myself feeling kind of rudderless sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm not sure what to do or what's next or where to go. And especially as I get older, you're a couple of years older than me, but I'm right there. We're contemporary. And, um, and so I'm finding that I'm, I'm, having trouble putting any kind of boundaries or setting any kind of goals or anything. Like I've just become a little bit, I think lethargic or something in my years of not being in a regular office environment. Right. And so it's one thing, I mean, it's been now seven years or eight years that I've just been totally on my own. Right. And so, and then, you know, COVID sort of slowed things down too. So I think some of this intention stuff could be really valuable. And, uh, and I do want to get into that some more. So, but let's talk about, you know, or sort of, I guess, the logical next step. After you've set your intention about not lying, what did you discover? Uh, that I was a liar. <laughs> that it blew me away. All the areas of my life is <laughs> incredible. Where I just glossed over things, told myself it was okay, whitewashed everything, everything from what I ate to you know, how I took care of myself to, I mean, stupid little things to, you know, doing things, chores around the house to how I, how I showed up to my friends or even just talked to them and scheduled my life. Every facet of my life, there was some whitewashed. I either didn't want to be there or I was holding back or I couldn't quite tell the whole truth because I didn't want to hurt people's feelings. And all of it, honestly, the person that hurt the most was me. And really exploring that was mind blowing. Yeah, no, it's an interesting insight. I mean, especially as it comes to that, I'm just thinking even in my own life, right? I remember at one point I had made a decision that when people were, you know, again, being intentional, but people, uh, you know, would ask me what I was doing or how you doing or whatever. And I can't remember what I used to say, but I used to just have kind of this, 
you know, I don't know, flippant kind of whatever response, negative response. And I switched it up to just saying so good, you know, so how are you doing? Oh, I'm so good. You know, and so to your point about sort of whitewashing things, you know, on good days or bad days, I would say I was so good. Right. So sort of whitewashing, but I was trying to do the opposite, which I was trying to trick myself into being so good. Right. So that I was always in that space. And so um, so I think there is something to that concept of, of, you know, I guess the awareness around what you're saying and, and how even just those kind of little white lies or those little white washes, even though they don't feel like much over time can compound and maybe become a bigger issue. Yeah. So this is an interesting topic and let me know where you want to take this, but you know, whether you call it fake it till you make it, whether you call it positive affirmations to make myself just get there. Part of it is what I've found. Um, when we when, in this integrity journey, right? Part of it is, especially as men, we don't allow ourselves to fully have our feelings, right? Emotions happen to us. Feelings are what we ultimately choose or don't choose to respond physiologically to these emotions. And be, for instance, you get angry, right? Anger is an emotion. Something happens for 90 seconds. It washes over you. You get flushed. And you can respond. You can yell. You can choose to, because you have awareness, sit calmly and let it pass over you and actually feel it. You can choose to turn, it turns into sadness. And sometimes it feels like we don't have choice here. Uh, But at its core, as we pull this stuff back, we really do. And um, living in integrity, and that piece for me starts with it, having these emotions because too often, and I did this and I find so many other humans do this and men are really bad at this. We take that emotion. We're like, Nope, not going to have it. Shove it down. And it just builds and it builds. And we either lose our shit. Eventually it just, it it turns into something else and then festers and bleeds out in some other ugly way. um, Or it turns into a midlife crisis for us. Right. So that's part of where, um, this integrity piece becomes really, really important for me. Um, And when we talk about kind of these positive affirmations or living in this, living in hope in a way, right? Like, gosh, I hope today's better. Gosh, a friend of mine said this and it just struck me sideways. And he said, living in hope is like living drunk. I was like, okay, I think I get it, but you need to explain this. And he said, you know, we talk about controlling the controllables, right? We, at the end of the day, we only control ourselves, right? We have choice for ourselves. And when we live in hope, and I hope you show up a certain way, and I hope you do this, and I hope one day maybe you change. We're, it's literally like drinking alcohol every day and just numbing ourselves and maybe it'll happen. Why live that way? Why, why not be in integrity and, and be honest and say, Hey, it's not this way. I don't like it. I can't do anything about it. I'm either going to acknowledge it and do something different, move a different direction, or I'm going to help that person if I can, but I'm not just going to hope. I'm not just going to pretend like it's all perfect and great. And maybe someday it will be. Yeah. There's something in there that is another one of these like perennial topics on this show that I've been trying to get through, which is this whole idea of in simplest terms, it's, you know, reading the book and then acting on what's in it. Right. So it's like, we all, we've all read all the business books, but we're not all Warren Buffett. So there's clearly a disconnect. So I explore this topic a lot with different people. And I was talking to a guy the other day and, you know, I've always sort of attributed it to it being a fear problem, you know, that people can't make that next step because they're afraid. And, uh, you know, and it's maybe a little more nuanced than that. Maybe we just need more guidance. Maybe we could make the step if somebody held our hand or whatever. Right. You know, so maybe it's not totally fear, but that's sort of my, my shorthand for what, what I think this is. So, but this other guy is talking to the way he put it was sort of this cognitive dissonance that basically what you're doing is you're setting yourself up to do other things. Instead, you read the book instead of doing the work you did, you know, uh, you went to the class or you saw the speaker or you downloaded the software or you whatever, instead of actually doing the thing. And we do this to make ourselves feel busy or feel like we're doing something. And the example of this in my own life is I, I keep threatening to start painting again. I used to be really artistic when I was a kid and I keep threatening to do this. Well, I buy art supplies like they're going out of style. 
I'm up to the roof with canvases and paintbrushes and paint and all that stuff, but I'm yet to start. And this has been going on for two years that I'm telling people and trying to be intentional. And, you know, I feel like being public about, oh, I'm going to start painting again. You know, we'll put some pressure on me to do it. Yeah, I never do it. And that's kind of what this guy was saying is this cognitive dissonance is this thing that I'm basically buying art supplies to stave off the fear of actually having to do the work. And so, and it seems like your, your, I, I don't know if we want to call it a hack or whatever, but this concept of having integrity or sort of working through these, like in your case, just the lies is sort of the same thing, right? Like if you could push through this lie or if you could be totally honest, then maybe you would actually start. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it, part, like, first off, what you're doing is we've all done it. I've done it a million times, zero judgment here, but you're living in this place of hope that you can get back to this place and that not that you were an amazing artist, you are an amazing artist, but you, you're hoping you can get back to the place of just starting it. And when I say hope is like living drunk, it's like when you're living drunk, you, you're not ever going to execute. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you show up and you're like, fuck, this is hard. This is going to hurt. I don't want to do this. And I'm just put the paintbrush in my hand. I, this is ugly as, oh, it's getting better. And you just start doing it. And that's what that's where I stepped into and, and figured out how to write a book, which I've never done before. Didn't know anybody who'd written a book. Show, understand or figuring out how to show up and surrender and going, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm going to mess this up. It's going to hurt. It's going to be hard as heck to show up every day. And yet, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. So... I'm actually here, by the way. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, apologize for the uh, throwback to the car um, because we've done this before and we discussed this beforehand. But uh, um, so you read this book, you decide you're going to be in, have integrity and tell yourself the truth and tell everyone the truth. And then you get a divorce and write a book. Like what? what's what's the, what happened? Like <laughs> what changed? What, what pivot did you do to, to, I mean, I don't know. I go further. Tell us more of your story. Sure. Sure. So, um, I got married at a young age. I was 25. Um, got married because we got pregnant and, um, did everything we were supposed, we thought we were supposed to do in life, <clears throat> you know, attempted to fall in love, make this life that we all wanted to. I chased my career path and honestly didn't show up for myself and didn't show up for her. And not that it's all my fault, but I know what I didn't do in my relationship and my marriage. And yet I yearned for more along the way, as most of us probably do. And it was about 2014 that I started to explore spirituality differently, that I started to explore what else there was in life. And that set me off on this journey. And I got divorced in 2020, um, separated in 2020, divorced in 2021. So before all this happened and my kids are older, it was just this point where we'd fallen out of love. It wasn't working. Um, and it, the, we can get into the specific reasons if it's interesting, but the bottom line is after eight, 19 years of marriage, it just, it was time for something different. And in my journey, it all started to fast forward as I had now more time to myself. I had to refigure out who I was without this partner of 19 years. And part of that journey was a year into it, I found this book on integrity. And that happened to be that stage of my journey at that point in time. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, so you weren't you weren't like uh, you didn't read this book and all of a sudden decide no. to flip your life upside down and and no, yeah. that was about a hundred and eighty two books into my journey. <laughs> well, and it, it's funny, you know, because like it, we've talked to you know this is interview three hundred and thirty or three hundred and twenty nine or something like that, and uh, we talk to a lot of people who have sort of the kind of trajectory that you do, right? We call it the ten year overnight success. Right. Which is, exactly. you know, it seems like you just started this a year ago. Right. But really, you started laying this fundamental groundwork before, you know, and for you, it was spirituality. I mean, I think a lot of people have tried dabbling with, you know, meditation or, you know, whatever it is that works for them. And um, and so I think 
that, you know, it, it's interesting or good that, you know, you gave us that little bit of backstory just because I think that helps show that this didn't culminate just instantly, in, you know, through one read. Um, but one thing I think it reveals that I think a lot of people suffer with, and, you know, I don't know if this was the case in your marriage, but I know, you know, other people that I know, contemporaries and stuff, this is a problem. Um, and, and I think it ties back to your book is this understanding that we actually do have a choice in everything. And so you are talking about this integrity. You made a choice to, to be in, you know, to act with integrity, but I think a lot of people don't even realize they have a choice or a say in the matter. Right. I think a lot of people get married because they think they have to or they stay together because they think they should or they yeah. are trying to hold up some image or look a certain way in the neighborhood or, you know, whatever it is. Right. People have their things. But I think a lot of times we float through life and we don't think that much about the fact that, you know, in a sense, we're making a choice, whether you're good or bad or whatever, but, um, but that we even have the power to make a choice. And so I think it might be good to talk about that and maybe just sort of take our conversation from a moment ago up a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about just even understanding that we have say in the matter. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. That's the entire point to the book I ended up writing. And interesting enough, I wrote, ended up writing the book and it says so in my dedication. It says, you know, I dedicate this book to Brent Perkins. Yes, myself. And while that sounds now narcissistic, it, it goes on to say that, um, you know, I dedicate this to myself because it's I'm doing the work that only I can do. And I hope it inspires other people to do the work that only they can do. And as I didn't realize at the time, but as I reflect back, this book was the next stage on my journey. The lessons in it were for me. It's become my Bible. I had somebody asked me, have you know, have you listened to your own own work or did you just do it? You put it out there and you just let it be. I'm like, no, I've listened to it like 27 times. And I've <laughs> read the book over and over again because it's my lesson. And this lesson for me, like where it all culminated is that at the end of the day, there's always choice on the other side of a truth is just another truth. And uh, I think I can explain this quickly. And that is, it was Einstein who said, um, Life is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. And what he meant by that was, is when you look at quantum mechanics, you know, it's kind of changed the way we look at, at the world and, and, and science on things in that <clears throat> nothing is quite as it seems. <clears throat> and what he meant by that was not that there's not real objects. You know, I'm talking into a microphone. I'm seeing you through a, a video camera. Those are real. But the illusion part is, is that, we only understand these things through our sight, smell, taste, touch, and sound, right? Our five senses is, are how we interpret the world. And that's why it's an illusion because what you're hearing and seeing and the way I'm moving and looking at you and the smells that are in your room and what's happening with Mike and whatever's happening in his car, like these things mean different things. We're interpreting them differently. So we're going to walk away from this conversation and go, this is how I felt. This is what it meant to me. This is probably what the listeners are going to hear. This is what Ryan heard or Mike heard or Brent heard. It's always different. And this is where we have choice because I may not understand that what Mike's going through right now is, is that he's outside of a hotel. He's tapped into their Wi-Fi. He had to go to the bathroom. He's got things happening that we're not necessarily understanding. And it's impacting how he shows up. And I may be interpreting it as, yeah, he's kind of being rude. How do you do this on a podcast? And I, I can choose to have that negative viewpoint or a positive viewpoint, um, but n neither one is right or wrong. You you know, guys I look at smack about me again. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. yeah, we waited until you left, and then we made yeah. you a role. I look model. at this as you know, <laughs> at, at forty five. I look back at eighteen. I do not think about politics or vote the same way I did when I was eighteen. And does that make me wrong when I was eighteen? No. Does that make me right today? Not necessarily. It's how I choose to show up and view life, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's so much about just that in choice, right? Like not so much that there's a good and a bad, it's just there's a choice and an outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And it might be positive for you or maybe it isn't, or I mean, maybe you voted poorly when you were young or, or maybe you voted awesome and now you're screwing it up. Like, I mean, you just never know. Right. <laughs> and so, but, it, but I mean, so much of this is subjective, right? And so it's how you're going to experience and how you're going to take everything. And so I think that that's an interesting way to think about choice, because I think a lot of times we get caught up in right or wrong. We get caught up in social pressure. 
especially nowadays with, uh, you know, social media and all this stuff, it feels like there's a lot more social pressure on things. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that, again, sort of either maybe adds to this illusion Einstein was talking about, which is that we start to forget that we're allowed to change things or that we can step in and be proactive about our lives or our relationships or our work or our whatever it is. And so, uh, so I think that that idea that just choice even exists, even as silly as it sounds, might be novel for some of our listeners today. So the book I wrote, I titled it Paper Cuts, The Art of Self-Delusion. And it's not that I really want to argue with people or get into, you know, what's a delusion, what's not. But I did it in a fun way, because if we take what we just talked about, and that in any situation, there's choice, and there's really not a right or wrong choice, right? Um, I kind of create a model and play around with that our choices are really our delusions because if if it's true that we're living in an illusion in terms of the experience we're having then our interpretation of that illusion it has to be a delusion because a delusion is not real it's not necessarily fact right it's well not it's definitely not fact but if you can walk away from any experience and have a belief a truth around your understanding of that experience and then Mike calls you later and he's like, dude, I just did some research. This happened in Brent's life. We didn't know this. And you go, oh, my truth is now over here. If you can hold two truths, whether in a five-minute span or a 25-year span from the way you used to vote, how is it anything but a delusion? And that's why I argue that become the artist of your delusion. Choose, understand that you can paint that picture however you want but do it out of integrity and you're always choosing the best choice at that point in time. Kind of, I was raised in a religious family and I don't, I'm not a religious person anymore. I don't, um, yeah. I'm not that guy. And so if I come across as like not interested or hostile or, or whatever vibe you're getting from me, uh, it's because of that. Um, it's mm -hmm. not, you've said some trigger words like in, surrender and integrity and, and stuff that was forced down my throat as a kid that um, I've been avoiding for quite a long time because I just don't prescribe to that anymore. And so it's hard for me to kind of um, I, I like to kind of go down these roads in a different kind of um, verbiage per se, like get to the same point, but not with uh, the, the, the buzzwords that you use, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> sure. So it, please, please don't take my uh, reticence or stepping out of the vehicle for a second as a, um, you know, in, in that way, because that's not, that wasn't my intent. So my apologies. Uh, I didn't. <laughs> no apologies needed. And yeah. um, I grew up the same way. Uh, I mm -hmm. have a plaque from my senior year in high school that says church member of the year. And uh, I haven't stepped in a church in 20 years. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a book by uh, Todd Henry that uh, kind of, I think, goes down the same kind of road or path. I haven't read your book. I apologize. Um, I, I've been really busy lately, but um, he's very, his whole thing is authenticity and being authentic and putting yourself out there in a true manner to, to, you, you know, don't, don't whitewash it. Just be yourself and tell the truth and always tell the truth. And I kind of see some parallels. Um, can you maybe tell us about, why you picked this subject and why you wrote a book about it. So I've kind of touched on this already. I don't know. I, <laughs> a, a year ago, December, I, I'm sorry. So January of 2022, I started a meditation practice. Um, and I was sitting in meditation after I, I, I had quit. I'd stepped away from my CEO job this last December. And, uh, it literally came through. It was like, you're going to write a book. And I was like, shut the, I'm not <laughs> writing a book. This is crazy. And the next day I was like, you're going to write a book and here's the title. 
I was like, this is insanity. But I journaled what the title was. I'm like, what does this even mean? Paper cuts. And I sat with it for a week and my daughter's like, it's December, dad. Enjoy the holidays. Just go with it. And it was January 7th. I'm like, I think this is like my next part of my journey. And I didn't have any content for the book. I sat down and tried to like wrangle it through like outlining it and being like strategic about, oh, let me out, you know. And I spent a month and I wasted my time. And it was February 1. And I'm like, okay, this is my lesson. Surrender is my lesson. Like letting go of me trying to control everything in my life is my lesson. And I just did it. And I, I'm like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show up four days a week for four hours. I blocked off time in my schedule. And I just started writing. And I started, I tried three days a week to have coffee with friends or just reach out to people in my life. I started recording conversations. I'd go back and re-listen to them and I'd start writing either word for word what we, what you know, dictating what we talked about or then what's the lesson here? And it all came together in 60 days. I wrote the entire book. It all formed because I finally was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm talking to these people. I don't even know what, I'm just asking questions and having conversations. And I let go of control. And it all happened. And it, yeah. it was my lesson. Like the writing the book and the people I spoke to in the lessons, they were my lesson. It was my next step in the journey. And I had no idea. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, to Mike's point, you know, about Todd Henry's book, like I think that, you know, a lot of these sort of like human truths have been gone over since, you know, forever. Yeah. Right? I mean, all the way yep. back to the Greek philosophers and whatever. Like people have been trying to crack this nut. But I think it, it's or what's valuable is I think people looking at it through their lens and taking it through their life experience and then regurging it in whatever version that comes out as. Right. So in the case of Mike, you know, Todd Henry's version, you know, really hit home for him, mm -hmm. you know, in your case, I seem to be vibing off of what you were talking about, you know? So, I mean, so there's like, you know, but I think so much about life is timing and it's having the right thing happen at the right moment. You know, yep. like you had your child encourage you to take a month off that maybe you wouldn't have if you were a busy entrepreneur, CEO, you know, cranking away at work. You might not have taken the time to be open to hear that thing. Right. So you might have heard paper cut and went, ouch, I got a paper cut. And then <laughs> exactly. and left. That could have been it. And so um, so I think it's really important that mm -hmm. in that moment you were able to hear it and you were receptive to hearing it. You know, your meditation practice might have tapped into that a little bit or gave you some some moments of clarity that allowed you to sort of hear a thing whatever that is. Right. And, uh, I, I think Stephen Pressfield calls it the muse mm -hmm. and, uh, and I really like his take on, on art and this concept of, you know, roadblocks that keep you from doing the things you want to do and stuff. And, uh, and so I think that it's really valuable that you stopped and took the time. And I think this goes back to this concept of choice and, and back to our earlier discussion about intention, right? Like, I think, first of all, you need to realize that you can make a change. Second of all, you have to actually take some action on it, right? Whether that is just setting an intention, which is sort of a meditative practice or it sort of comes with that universe of stuff, For sure. you know, but, you know, whether that's how you get to it or you do a version like mine where you just say, hey, you know what? I've got to be a blockbuster employee this time, you know, like now I, I've really got to make hay while the sun's shining. So however that manifests for you, I think, you know, you can you can go your own way. But I think the steps that we're describing here are the, are the how you get there. And, uh, and I think that's really interesting. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, I, I actually read the war of art right in the middle of writing this book. And I mean, Stephen Pressfield's advice really is like to beat that demon, to, you know, you just got to show up and showing up is like, it's letting go of control. It's not knowing what the heck's going to come out. He's like, just start writing. Like, put your fingers down on the keyboard and just go. Yep. And for people who don't know, Stephen Pressfield is an author. And, you know, he, he wrote, like, uh, I think it's The Legend of Bagger Vance and some of these other things. And, you know, so he's, he's a well-known author. But this concept that he talks about is resistance, which is the thing that keeps us from doing the thing. Uh, I think the way we're talking about it in this conversation is the power of choice or the, the you know, intention setting. But it's basically it's the same thing that we're trying to get over, right? Yeah. And so I think it's, uh, you know, interesting how Stephen Pressfield's book was really valuable for me as a guy in the art space and who deals with this, you know, muse creative person you know, or whatever it is. And so, um, so I think it's really uh, valuable. information. Yeah. And are you speaking to the war of art specifically in his methodology on how to actually accomplish some of these creative tasks? 
Yeah. Yeah. The war of art was the big one for me. I can't remember the title of his second one. His second one was good too though. And, uh, well, second sort of in that series, but so I, I might be conflating the two, but yeah, it's the, these ideas of, of the muse and then working through resistance that for me are really important. Can you, um, give us a, an overview of your book? What, what kind of subject matter it dives into? Yeah. So we've, we've, we've touched on it a little bit. Um, it really walks through where in my life I was gripping onto control. And as, as we start, it's why I, I paint the picture early on in the book about this illusions and delusions and what does it really mean? And where do we have, where do we start to like the, the, the premise of the book is owning your agency and your agency isn't, Hey, I'm going to go have sushi tonight. Now I want Mexican food. Your agency is at every juncture whether it's to another person, whether it's in your own head, you have choice on everything. That is what agency is. That is what free will, whether you believe it was divinely given to you or not, we all have free will as the only thing. Viktor Frankl talks about it in, you know, in his unique perspective being a, you know, Auschwitz survivor in man's search for meaning. But it's it's free will is the one thing we all have unequivocally, without bias, right? We all have that. Now, how we use it. Is and again, I'm not saying anything new, but it's my angle, which is, hey, we have choice. And the what one, one of the other things I talk about in the book is that truths are always subjective. That's why we talk about your truth and my truth, because a truth is a fact with a layer of belief on top of it. And there's just not a lot of facts in this world. Like absolute facts are very, very few. So we have beliefs layered on top of all of them to, to allow us to have our truths. And that's where um, we get confused sometimes because I, you know, I might be like, this is my truth and it better be your truth or else we're going to have, why? Why does my truth have to be your truth? It's just for me. It helps me understand my world and how I choose to interpret it, right? doesn't need to be yours. You have a different experience. Mike, you grew up different than me. That's okay. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And another one of the things that you sort of dig into is this idea of sort of being blissfully ignorant and how to sort of, you know, live a good life or understand that you're living a good enough life, right? Yep. And I think that, you know, this is akin to these concepts about, you know, don't live a life of regret. Don't, you know, all, all these kinds of things. And one of the things, just to make sure I hit all the tropes today, so Mike can roll his eyes, um, there's this uh, thing that I always say that sort of helps me stem off regret, which is this idea that it took every step I've ever taken to get to where I am today, right? So there was no right, there was no wrong, there was no left or right, just, you yeah. know, there was no getting to this conversation today without having done everything I did prior, Yeah. right? And by thinking about it that way, I go, okay, well, I didn't screw up, I didn't make mistakes, I'm not where I'm not supposed to be. But this idea of being blissfully, blissfully ignorant, as I understand it, is, you know, basically making peace with the life that you've built so that you don't spend your whole life feeling, you know, horrible that you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Or at least at that point, you can now apply this layer of choice to it. So I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about that concept. Yeah. So it's actually a slightly different than that. So I don't believe in regret anymore. Um, I think you said it perfectly. All these things happen in life for me for a reason. Uh, I may have had to circle back on some things and learn them in different ways, maybe for a decade because <laughs> it was difficult. And there are people in my life who hate this answer that I'm giving right now. They hate it. It's like, you know, I'm hurt because of you. Like, yeah, look, I wouldn't go back and do what I did again. And if I hadn't have done those things, I wouldn't be the man I am today. I wouldn't be sitting here and able to look at you in the eyes and have a different conversation and hear you and see you in a way I was never able to hear and see, see people in the past. And I have, I apologize and I'm, I choose to show up differently and I will express that to you. I don't regret it because regret is filled with shame and, and guilt. And that doesn't serve anybody. Right. And the fact that you got hurt by me, that's, a, that's a more nuanced conversation in terms of how you chose to actually accept and hear and, 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 and I didn't punch you in the face. Um, so I, I can't make you actually feel something, even though it may have been a shitty situation. You still had choice. 
And there's a role you played in that too. So that's just playing the victim to blame it all on somebody else. Yet I understand where my role and all of our roles are in this. We impact other people. We influence them, right? And when we talk about being blissfully ignorant, where that shows up in my book is is a story with a friend of mine who lives a great life. And he's happy-ish. And the part about being blissfully ignorant is that on the surface, we all, let me rephrase that. I know I have chased what seems like, gosh, that person has it made. They have a great house. They have a great wife. They have a great job. They have enough money. They they get to vacation. And all these things aren't what they seem on the surface. And that's what I was talking about with, with my friend who has these things on the surface and yet He's got his head in the sand. He is blind to all the, he's not living in integrity with himself. And so everything is just good enough. And at the core, he's really not happy. He's numbing himself with alcohol and golf and these things that just kind of hide him really understanding and exploring and doing the things for him because it's just, it's blissfully ignorant and it's okay, but let's be honest about it. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. And I think, you know, obviously this is something that I think a lot of people struggle with, right? I mean, is, is coasting through life. I know that this is something that I I've felt in, you know, myself kind of recently, and I don't know why I'm tuning into it recently, but, um, I feel like I've just kind of been at this grind, right? Mm -hmm. Like I just, I do my work every day. I shuffle my paper every day, but nothing really all that valuable is happening, right? Like we're just kind of doing the thing we do and, you know, this goes back for me personally, this concept of choice, right? Understanding that if I want to change the situation, I need to get out of that sort of living in hope mentality and start actually making some changes. But understanding that I can make the change, I think, is one of the things I've got to get through. And then this concept of being blissfully ignorant, you know, I mean, I show up for my kids. I do all that stuff. I'm not drunk all the time, you know, none of that stuff. But at the same time, I'm doing what I think I'm supposed to be doing because I think I'm supposed to be doing it without a whole lot of thought, right? This is just what I've always done, so I'll continue to do it, and that's it. And, uh, and so I think that there's some real lessons to be taught there in that concept of trying to live a life that isn't necessarily blissfully ignorant. Yeah. So Ryan, you and I seem to be on the same page, Mike. I seem, you seem to have questions. I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to know how, how, cause this is what's amazing about life. Like all these things mean and register so different with each of us. And I would love you to speak up because I guarantee you half the people feel like Ryan and half the people feel like you, Mike. And here well, you I, I keep thinking of like the blissful ignorance, right? When, when I was a kid, we, we lived in a trailer in a farm, you know, and we didn't have a nice car. We had a, an Astro van that barely got us from home to church yeah. and back. And um, I remember loving life. Didn't matter. It's great. I get to go play with cows and chickens and, and it's awesome. You know, it's great. And then, you know, that to me is like blissful ignorance. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter that you're you're poor, that you, um, you might not have what the Joneses have. If you don't know any better, it's fun. It's great. And, um, I, I think, you know, everyone has a different path. Everyone has a different mindset of what matters. Um, whether it's, you know, you want the new latest, greatest car, or you want the new latest, greatest phone or this or that, the material possession, sometimes that doesn't really matter. Sometimes it's a matter of who you're with and a matter of the experiences that you have in your life. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, and I would just add to that, Mike, that I think you're you're dead on with that, but I think it takes maturity to get there. I think it's yeah. really really easy to be a young person caught up in all that Jones's bullshit. But well, I've been I've been yeah. chasing it my whole life. Oh yeah, me too. I'm totally you know, like I have my new I'm, iPhone. I'm a DJ. Soon. I've been single and and living out of cars literally right now um for my whole life because I've been chasing the high of music and chasing the experience and you know it's like 
stepping back and realizing that you want more and trying to get to that next level. The last four years I've been trying to learn how to do software development so I can have stability in my life and have the potential to have a relationship and have a family because I don't have that right now. And, um, it's kind of cool to, to have a goal to work towards, but at the same time, I'm just rambling right now. I don't even know where, where the hell I'm going with this, but, uh, you're, you're, you're putting thoughts in my head that, um, I haven't like pondered in a while. So if I'm kind of over here in left field doing my own thing, I'm just thinking about what's well, the conversation. It's funny, and Mike, and my life. I, I feel like I know you well enough. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but at the oh, same God, time, here like, we go. No, no, no. But like, <laughs> but I think what you're saying is kind of what we've been talking about. Right. Like, and, yeah. and I think you're, you're experiencing it in your way, given mm-hmm. your life circumstances. And these are the same things I'm dealing with now. I luckily I have a marriage that's working and I have kids that we're happy with. And like, so I've got that thing, but I don't have the freedom that you do, for example, you know? So, but we're both arriving at the same spot where we're going or, or we're trying to make decisions or, or recognize the fact that we have choice about the way we're going. Right. So you started being really intentional about, Hey, I, I want to get some stability in my life. So I'm going to focus energy on, on doing software development and building a skill that I can turn into a steady paycheck one day, you know, and you know, you're pursuing relationships and you're doing other things that are, are, changes for you from how you've been right for me it's more career centric or or even maybe even a little more selfish and that i want to try and do better with myself and get out of my own head sometimes and things like that so there's you know different choices being made but i I think what we've been discussing throughout this podcast this idea of just even understanding we have choice is the novel concept right and so you're taking that and running with it in the direction that suits you best you know i'm making excuses about why I haven't done that yet, but I will eventually make a choice about something I'm sure. And, uh, and so that's kind of where we're at, but I think that, you know, hearing you say what you're saying, Mike, I I mean, I think even if you've arrived at these ideas in a different way, I think you're saying the same thing, right. Or at least you're recognizing the same issues, which is, you know, we, we, as men, as people, as whatever, you know, and all being sort of contemporary in age, you're the, the baby here in the crowd, Mike. But, um, <laughs> you don't get told you're the baby very often, I imagine. No, I know. But, um, but, you know, but I think we're all arriving at the same sort of crossroads in our lives, but we're all got, we all got there through different criteria. Mm. Right? I, I don't know if that makes any sense. So if, if I made that I, I sound think, I think stupid. a matter of it is, is um, finding your, your target. You know, if you don't have something you want to aim for, a bullseye or, or something you want to work towards. There's no point in even having the integrity or having the, the the authentic self to, to get you there. You know, like you could go and, and drink all day or do this or do that and, and uh, have no purpose in life because you're just kind of, you don't know what you want. And once you kind of figure out what you want, then you have something to work towards. And it, it's just a matter of defining your why. Yeah. Yeah. And see, and I think you're a step ahead of me in that regard, which is that you've identified a couple targets that you want to pursue and you're putting in the work to get to those things. Right. In my case, I'm really struggling with that goal. Right. So that's where I think I started the conversation by saying I'm feeling a little bit rudderless. Right. Like I, I'm not really sure where I'm going. I'm adrift and you know, we're doing okay and, and things are all right and they're not painful enough that I have to make any changes. But at the same time, I don't really have a direction. You know what I mean? And so, so for me, my choice is maybe a step or two behind yours because you've at least identified a thing, but I think that they're all sort of related. So, and actually maybe this leads into, I'm sorry, Brian, I should probably let you uh, respond, but at the same time, I think it might be a good segue into this concept of, of finding your bold and starting to, you know, be bold about the decisions we make and own the decisions that we're, we're making. And then just sort of how that pertains to maybe some men's issues in general. So it might be good to sort of hit all those. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to just share my own perspective, which is really just my experiences on what you guys just talked about. And that is I chased what I thought, like I had a target. It was like, my dad owned a business. I'm going to own a business. I'm doing this. I'm going to reach CEO. I did it all. Didn't get me happiness. Didn't, didn't do anything for me. And I actually ran across this a couple months ago. So kind of already way into this journey, but it was Picasso who said the meaning of life is to find your gift. 
or gifts. The purpose of life is to give them away. And that really struck a chord with me because I looked at, you know, we actually all have the exact same purpose. And that is to ultimately share with the world that which we are passionate about, we're great at, and we love doing. That's what our gifts are. And I had to ask myself, well, what are my gifts? Well, I'm vulnerable. I have a way of, um, you know, bringing truth to the table and being honest with people, but in a way that's not like a, you know, F you sort of way. This is, you know, it's this, it's this, it's taking risks. It's, it's, it's showing up um, and hearing and seeing other people. Like these are my gifts. These are the things I get passionate about. And if I, if I tried to like chase them in terms of like a purpose and give them away before I developed them, it'd be impossible. And this is where I think Picasso hit it right, which, you know, his gift was painting, right? It's capturing moments of time in in this beautiful way, in his own way. But if he tried to give that away before he failed and made horrible things and didn't understand how to do it, like he had to, to be selfish before he could be selfless. And I think that's a lesson that's so hard for a lot of us. It's like, that's narcissistic. That's selfish. Like, no, it's not. How can you give away anything until you've got it? It's the oxygen mask concept, right? You have to take care of you. You can't give away love unless you have it for you. You can't give money to somebody on the street unless you've earned it and have it for you. And too often I did this in my life. I I did the equation backwards and I wondered why it never really worked. Yeah. And that's where we start to step into what I'm, where I'm stepping into in my life is not going back to being a CEO again. Yeah. The money's probably better or maybe not, who knows, but I feel called at this point. I've now filled my cup in these areas. I feel called to now my purpose is to give it back. And what that looks like in my life is I'm starting this, I've started this company called three X bold, which is about being courageous, authentic and wild in our lives and it stems from choice. It stems from what I've learned in this book, at the, which is like this culmination of my journey. And really, while the book is for all genders, for everybody, I feel called to support men. Yeah, I can relate with men. I am a man. I've gone through this journey. I have kids. I've been divorced. I've, you know, I resonate better. And I'm starting this small cohort called the Bold Men Fellowship because I want to teach men to get to a point where you show up to life and it doesn't matter what somebody thinks, what's going to happen over here. You're making decisions or choices for you out of integrity for your own life. And being bold means you can show up into any situation. And if you make a choice out of integrity for you, you don't care. This It's like the ultimate courage piece. It's the ultimate authenticity. It lets you be wild in situations because you're showing up for you. And when you do that in the best way, it automatically is the best thing for other people too. Yeah, no, it's interesting that the quote uh, uh, from Picasso that you just shared like really resonates with me. It's funny because before you were on the call, Mike and I were just killing a couple minutes talking. And uh, one of the things I was sharing with him is that I feel like I'm not doing anything all that big or important, right? And like I said, I'm just kind of shuffling papers. I'm doing my work. You know, we do a lot of creative work for a lot of people. So we we are making things, but it's just like my role in this is just kind of keep the pieces moving. Right. And so for me, I feel like I've lost a step in that I'm not doing anything that's like wildly impactful. And it's funny because like when Mike and I were much younger, uh, he was sort of the lead, but he and I used to do a lot of concerts together, actually in Phoenix. And so we used Hmm. to run a lot, a lot of concerts down there. And, um, so even though they were like little shows, you know, 500 to a thousand people, you know, these little concerts or whatever, it felt like I was doing something impactful, right? We were organizing a thing, we were achieving a goal and we, and we would walk away from it and reflect, right? So like, I mean, we did the whole cycle, you know, and there's not a lot of other things in my life right now, you know, and, and maybe this could be paintings or maybe it could be, you know, helping other people or I don't know what it is yet, but, but there's this thing that I think people need to experience, which is sort of set a goal, achieve a goal, reflect and repeat, 
right? And and I think for a lot of people, they don't get that very often. And I know in my case, I don't feel like I'm getting it a lot. And, you know, we do it on a micro level, which is, you know, hey, we've got a new project, we designed the project, we get feedback on the project, and we've completed a job, right? So, I mean, we are doing it on a micro level. But in terms of grander, bigger things that are more important to sort of either myself personally, or sort of the world in general, I don't feel like I have a lot of those things in my life right now. And so this concept of, you know, find your gift and give it away is really interesting to me just in that, you know, again, I mean, I, I've shared the story about painting or trying to, you know, start painting again. But the the idea is, you know, I've, I've been artistic my whole life. It sort of got stifled with my career. I mean, I still do art every day, but I do commercial art and a computer and stuff like that. It's just different. And so, and I'm not sharing anything that's sort of authentic to me, right? Like I'm building something for your brand or something for your company or, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, and so that doesn't necessarily have a connection with sort of who I am as a person. So I'm not sharing my thing outside of the fact that I executed your thing. Right. And so, so I think that there's something in there that, you know, is worth unpacking, which is just this concept of, you know, being able to find your gift, share your gift, but I think part of it goes into this being bold or, or making bold decisions or acting in a bold way, um, because I think that you have to be able to do that to achieve these kinds of things. Yeah, thank you for, do you want to help me write the next book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think we're almost to that time. You want to tell people where they can reach out and how they can get in touch with you if they're interested? Yeah, they can find my book. It's on Amazon in all formats. I actually just did the audio book last month, um, which was an interesting process. I narrated it myself. Um, but Paper Cuts, The Art of Self-Delusion. If you want to follow along with anything else I'm doing, especially if you're a, um, you know, you're a man, you're a father, um, and some of this resonates with you, uh, I'm doing some work with other dads in that area at 3x, the number three, the letter x, bold.com. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I think it's real important. We didn't get into a lot of these men's issues or anything, but it, we're uh, parents to boys and he, and my wife has been raising boys and just sort of in our current climate, seeing what boys are experiencing in terms of sort of stifling uh, masculinity and, you know, other other issues, you know, around expectations of men and, and some of these mm -hmm. things that have sort of evolved or changed, not necessarily for the better, but, um, you know, it, men's ability to sort of react or roll with what's going on in that sort of world, I think has changed quite a bit lately. And so, uh, so I think these groups are kind of, kind of interesting and so, yeah. uh, and, and valuable. For I want to say one thing on this topic, cause I think it's so important and wherever you guys take this in future shows or in your own life, but I'm so tired of hearing that masculinity is toxic. That's a load of crap. Masculinity is amazing. There's just people who express it with toxic behavior and that's a choice. That's, that's, that's a learned thing and it's a correctable thing. But I, I believe we need to teach, especially our young, young children, men, that your masculinity is where you are grounded, where you have strength, and where you actually can give back to humanity and other women and support them in their femininity through this grounded strength and develop that, not stifle it. So... No, I think it's really important. And uh, yeah, there's a, this quote, I'll probably screw it up, but it's this idea that hard times make hard men, hard men make easy times, easy times make easy men, and easy men make hard times. And I feel like we're sort of at the end of that trajectory where we're going to, you know, we've got sort of a, you know, and this sounds bad, but sort of a softer class of man right now that I'm afraid, you know, could lead to trouble in the future, you know? And uh, luckily, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of change. Just uh, my oldest boy is 16. So I know you have one that's sort of about that age. And so, you know, I'm seeing things with him and then I'm seeing things with our 12 year old that are, you know, somewhat troubling, but also kind of a course correction by our 12 year olds kid uh, age. So I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe stuff sort of straightens out. But anyway, it'll be uh, interesting to see. And I appreciate or uh, applaud your effort on uh, trying to help fellas out. Yeah. So um, one last time, do you mind just uh, give us your, your URL one more time before we get out of yeah, here? Yeah, three X bold.com, six, six letters, three X bold. Excellent. And uh, the book is Paper Cuts, The uh, Art of Self-Delusion, available on Amazon everywhere else. So thanks so much, Brent. I really appreciate your time, man. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Mike, Ryan, have an awesome day. Yep, take Absolutely. care. You too. And thanks to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. We'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.